before we get so before we get going, I just wanted to welcome everybody to um, the Center for Governance and Markets virtual seminar series on the economics of race and identity. I'm Jennifer Murtazashvili. I'm a professor of public and international affairs here at the University of Pittsburgh, and I direct our Center for Governance and Markets. It's a new research center recently established here. We are so thrilled to uh, introduce Christian Dippel, who's an assistant professor of economics at the Anderson School of Management at UCLA. But before I do this, I just wanted to say a few words about our center. Uh, the mission of CGM is important to understanding why we have created this event the way we did. Our goal is to understand the diverse institutions and governance arrangements that affect social order and human well being in the US and around the world. We generate knowledge of ways in which individuals and communities overcome challenges to living free, prosperous, and peaceful lives. And we do this through three main tools, through cutting edge research, by bridging the gap with the policy world, and through community engagement. And it's really important for us, for those of us who do research, not just to, to sit here, um, but also to engage in the communities where we work. So when we originally created this seminar series, we had created a nice uh, policy and political economy, uh, political economy series on campus for our quirky group of faculty, which include economists, political scientists, computer scientists, law professors, and uh, anthropologists. Um, but when COVID hit, we realized that our, our quirky on-campus approach to building community really didn't translate so well for a virtual world. So what we've done is we've cut up our PPE seminar into smaller mini seminars that are running this semester. And uh, so we have three of them. Uh, the, this is the first one and it's our inaugural uh, seminar on the uh, economics of race and identity. We're running a second seminar on uh, policing and police reform in the United States that's being led by um, Brandon Davis at the University of Kansas. And then the final seminar is on uh, networked governance and can we digitally govern ourselves? And we have Eric Aston uh, from uh, the University of Colorado who will be leading us on that discussion. And we have a four o'clock seminar for that uh, today, actually. Um, so this seminar series was the product of the collective imagination of several of our CGM faculty affiliates. Uh, Andy Ferreira, Allison Scherzer, Randy Walsh in the Department of Economics, and Ilya Murtazashvili, who teaches at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. So we're so grateful to all of them for making this happen. Um, it's a great topic, so very timely, and we're so fortunate to have Andy Ferreira, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Economics, here with us today to lead this discussion. And if you don't know Andy, he's doing some fascinating research right now. Um, his research sits at the intersection of labor economics and economic history. So without taking too much more of your time, I'm going to throw it over to Andy, who's going to be moderating our discussion today. Yeah, thank you so much, Jen. Um, like Jen said, we're very happy to have um, Chris Chindipal here uh, to present um, his paper on property rights without transfer rights, which is a study of um, Indian land allotment. And uh, like Jen said, Christian is assistant professor at the um, UCLA Anderson School of Management, and he has received his um, PhD from the University of Toronto. And Christian has uh, published his work in some uh, very high profile economics journals, such as Econometrica, the Economic Journal, or the American Economic um, Review. And um, he has spent a good amount of his career studying um, Native Americans, which at least in economics, a super important topic because as a group they're really under studied and uh, one reason for this is uh, the available um, data or the quality of this data and uh, Christian together with his um, co-authors Dustin Fry and Brian Leonard they always come up with very smart ways um, of how to deal with these um, issues. So today Christian is going to talk for 45 um, minutes during which you can ask only um, clarifying questions. And then in the last 15 minutes, um, we have a Q&A session. And then um, for whoever would like to talk a little bit more with Christian, uh, can stick around for another half hour. So Christian, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Andy, for, for the introduction. Um, I'm just pulling over your faces on my other screen. And we'll get started immediately. Okay, so um, yeah, as Andy already said, this is a paper about 
a, a specific limitation to property rights, uh, which is limitations to transfer rights. So the title of the paper is Property Rights Without Transfer Rights. And it is a study of Indian land allotments, so land allotments given to Native Americans in the US. Um, it's joint work with Dustin Fry, who is at Vassa College and who is also a member of the Northern Cheyenne tribe in Montana, and Brian Leonard, who is uh, at Arizona State. So the motivation for this paper from a, coming at it from a sort of general economics literature um, perspective is that uh, we all know that land rights are a cornerstone of economic development, especially in uh, poorer countries or developing countries settings. Um, among the global poor, land tends to be the main asset that people have and tends to be the only potential collateral that people have if they want to go to a bank or to a lender or to a micro lender and get uh, credit for any kind of uh, investment in the land or any kind of other economic activity. But um, strikingly and, and somewhat sort of a, a feature of this that has sort of largely escaped the attention of economists at least is that land rights quite frequently are what legal scholars call usufruct. So usufruct is a civil law term that means you have the right to uh, enjoy the land and to use it but it does not come with full legal title so if you have usufruct rights to land then you can use and enjoy that land you can work that land you can uh, keep any proceeds from the land uh, but usufruct rights do not entail transfer rights and so transfer rights would be the rights needed to sell your land. And as I'm gonna argue in a minute, when you cannot sell your land, you also cannot, when you cannot alienate your land, you also cannot collateralize it because if you can't alienate it, then a bank can't obtain the asset from you and therefore it doesn't qualify as collateral. So restrictions on transfer rights are pretty common. They are common among indigenous groups in Latin America. Uh, they are common in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we see them in many particularly indigenous settings, but also more, more broadly in, in, in developing country settings. Um, so an example that I recently came across was that when the US government introduced reindeer to Alaska natives in the, in the 1900s, they um, gave full property rights only to the Laplanders that were imported or brought in to, to teach Alaska natives how to, how to work the reindeer, but they only gave usufruct rights to the Alaska natives. So in other words, they could herd the animals, um, but they were quite restricted in their ability to sell them. Uh, and another famous example, somewhat off topic to the, to the indigenous topic, is India's ban on banning its own citizens from going into indentured servitude in 1917. So all of these are examples of restricting a population's rights to either land or their labor or what have you for paternalistic motives. So the motive in all of these cases is to protect the population from engaging in transactions that they might regret afterwards. So in the Native American context that we're gonna be looking at the restrictions of, on land rights really came from a concern that if you give people right to land and they have, perhaps you might worry that they have no culture of uh, that entails private property or has entailed private property for very long, or they might be susceptible to being duped out of their assets. And so it's out of this sort of paternalistic motive of wanting to protect people from selling an asset under value or or selling it all together and, and, and thinking that they may regret doing so afterwards, that you're getting these paternalistic restrictions on transfer rights. But, um, you know, running with this famous quote that the road to hell is paved by good intentions, um, what our study shows or what our study studies is, is the negative consequences on these, of these limitations on transfer rights. And so to understand these, let me give you a little bit more context on what the limitations on transfer rights on Native American reservations are going to entail. And then I'll give you a little bit of the history of 
um, wh where they came from historically. So transfer limits are distinct from a number of other issues. That's important to understand just in terms of getting a clean understanding of, of, of the phenomenon we're going to be looking at. So transfer limits are really just limitations on the right to alienate the land. And they are different from exclusion restrictions, which is the right to put a fence around your land. So in our context, the ability to uh, exclude others from your property is perfectly present. So exclusion rights are not compromised. Uh, in our setting, we also have perfect security of property rights in the sense that you can't lose your usufruct rights to the land. And there are no demarcation issues either, which is often a practical problem when um, property borders are not properly delineated. In, in our case, none of these problems are, are present. And what we're going to be really cleanly focusing on is these limitations on transfer rights. Uh, transfer limits on reservations uh, or to Native American owners of reservation land actually take two forms. One is that because you cannot alienate the land, so you cannot sell the land, as a result, you cannot collateralize it with the bank because the bank knows that if you default on a loan that they give you, they can't actually go and seize the asset, which means it's not collateral from their point of view. And so that creates problems of underinvestments. It creates the problem that you cannot use your land as collateral in the way that all of us or most of us would be able to use our houses, apartments or, or land as collateral. The second manifestation of this, which is really a distinct economic mechanism, but it sort of gets folded in under this umbrella of paternalistic, paternalistically limiting transfer rights, is that historically the Bureau of Indian Affairs on reservations did not allow the Native American recipients of the land we're going to be looking at to control their own testation. So to control um, who among their heirs would obtain the land through will writing. And what that uh, meant historically, let's say 100 years ago, is that rather than bequeathing your land to a single heir, all of your heirs got the land in equal undivided title, uh, which, lent, which led over time to a proliferation of claimants. And so today, in some instances, you have three to 400 claimants all having equal undivided claims on a single land allotment. And you can imagine that that creates large transaction costs in terms of agreeing to anything in terms of what to do with the land. And so these are distinct economic phenomena, and we're going to provide some evidence that both are at play in our setting, but we sort of think of them of the, under the umbrella of just limited transfer rights, paternalistically limited transfer rights. And so in our setting, we're going to be looking at Native American owned land in the United States. Um, what we're taking advantage of is a policy called Indian allotment which started in 1887. And so in 1887, you had a set of social planners essentially deciding that the way forward for Native Americans uh, was to culturally assimilate and the main way of cultural assimilation in the vision of, of the social planners at the time was to obtain private land rights. And so at this time, what you had is you had reservations, uh, Ownership on reservations was sort of just simply undefined. At the, at the time, there wasn't any kind of like formalized government on reservations. There wasn't any formalized tribal council. So in a sense, the, the reservations were collectively owned. But in a more formalized sense, there was just no real rules governing ownership. And so what land allotment did is it took the reservations, surveyed them. And then once they were surveyed, it carved out these 160 acre allotments. So the same as a as a homestead and it granted each household, each uh, Indian headed household, uh, such an allotment for paternalistic reasons. So out of, out of a fear that, uh, or a concern that the Native American recipients of this land might sell this land under value or might sell this land when they really shouldn't sell it at all and should instead learn to farm it and to work the land, they were um, very, um, stringent restrictions on what you could do with the land and in, ter and in particular strong transfer restrictions. So the land was held in trust by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which meant that the LOTs who had full usufruct rights, so they could work the land, they got to keep any proceeds earned by the land, but they couldn't sell it 
as a consequence, they couldn't use it as collateral. Uh, and then additionally, as a separate aspect, initially in the first 15, 20 years of allotment, they could not will it. They were prevented from will writing, which meant that ownership claims sort of proliferated historically over time. And that's something we still see today. To obtain full title, so just full, what we call fee simple title, which is sort of unconstrained property rights, you needed to be, clear, to be declared competent by the local representative of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And this happened, but it was a slow process. Typically, the, the transfer from um, interest to fee simple took around 25 years. And what happened then is that in 1934, so fast forward about 45 to 50 years, uh, social planners, a new generation of social planners came to be in charge of Indian land allotment and they decided that Indian land allotment was indeed not the way forward. And so what they did is they just froze the process into perpetuity. So they ended allotment. There were no more allotments made after the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 uh, and beyond stopping any further allotments, they also froze whatever had been done into perpetuity and that's what we still have today. And so the result of this 1934 Indian Reorganization Act is that lands on reservations today are this patchwork where you have large swaths of tribally owned land that is under um, the auspices of the of the tribal government. It's also in trust in, to some extent, but it's in trust held for the tribal government or the tribe as a whole entity. You have fee simple lands that are owned outright by the heirs of the original LOTs whose land was transferred into fee simple. So fee simple land is simply like any other land except that it's located on a reservation. And then you have this awkward in between kind of land uh, that is a lot of trust. And so this is a lot of land that was allotted to individuals perhaps 120 years ago, perhaps 80 years ago, and was never transferred into fee simple and still persists today under this awkward interest arrangement where it cannot be alienated, therefore cannot be collateralized. And by virtue of the fact that initially it could not be willed, it often also suffers from highly fractionated uh, highly fractionated ownership claims of a large number, in, in many cases, several hundreds of um, claimants, all of whom have equal undivided rights on the land. And so this is what we're looking at in this paper. So what we're doing is we're looking um, at allotment level comparisons, so really comparing individual allotments to get at the causal effect of these restrictions on transfer rights by really comparing the latter two categories. So we also will be comparing tribal land, but from a sort of statistical identification point of view, we have less credible identification there. So our main thrust is really to compare the bottom two categories of land that you see in the bottom bullet here on this slide, which is comparing fee simple land, so individually Native American owned land with full property rights relative to a lot of trust land, which is also individually owned Native American land but with these strong transfer restrictions on it. And just to recap one more time, what these transfer restrictions entail is they really entail two different economic hurdles or mechanisms, if you like, that are grouped together. One is the inability to collateralize. One is the fractionation of equal undivided claims, which gives rise to transaction costs in terms of being able to decide on what to do with this land. Christian, can I ask a question? Yeah. I think an expansive view of clarifying here. Is there any reason to think that these restrictions are anything but bad? Like I should think about this exercise as you're going to quantify how bad they are. Yeah. Is there ever a state of the world where paternalistic restrictions like this are good? Well, I think their motive is to protect people from making mistakes. And so I think from a social planner perspective, that becomes a philosophical question of your, your vision of the world, whether you should protect people from making mistakes. And because mistakes are possible, the, the answer to your question is yes. Because mistakes are possible, there can be a state of the world where it's good to prevent people from making mistakes. 
And then overall, the question is, is it worth the downside? Um, in this particular case, the question is sort of accentuated by the fact that you're locking this arrangement into perpetuity in 1934. So by now, fast forward 100 years, I think it would be very patronizing to argue that Native Americans still need to be protected from making choices over their own land. Um, but this, what maybe could have been called paternalistically motivated 100 years ago, in my view today, is a patronizing policy that is just written into the law and just prevents the claimants of this land to make their own choices of what to do with it. But, he's, but you seem to be suggesting that there could have been upsides 120 years ago. I mean, is there anecdotal evidence that people sold sold their allotment and I don't know what would be the most, they bought alcohol or something. I don't know what the most paternalistic thing you could possibly think would happen if you gave people the ability to sell their land. Absolutely. I think, I think we'll, we will never know how... Um, we will never know how effective this policy was in the early 20th century. Um, I think what we can say is locking it into perpetuity in 1934 was not a good idea. Whether there was real scope for protecting people from, um, from selling their land too early or maybe not giving or, or maybe selling it under value I think there was. I think there was definitely a period in time in the early 20th century when, you know, you make allotments to people who often had no good sense of how a sales contract is written, could easily be due, maybe didn't speak English very well. Um, there is the alcohol element of things for sure in the 1910s, 1920s. So, so we're not saying that putting these protections in place at the time. I don't think we're making a value judgment on that. I think, in fact, we definitely agree with the notion that they were there for a time. The problem arises from the fact that you're now locking these restrictions into perpetuity in 1934. All right. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. So I think, th well, thank you for asking that question. I think that's important. Um, okay. Let me roll on. So I'll give you a quick summary of our findings, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the identifying strategy we're using. So what we focus on is land use measured in satellite imagery. And we're comparing uh, individual trust allotted land versus individually held fee simple land on the same reservation. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the spatial scope of this comparison in a second. And so in a nutshell, we have uh, two types of land uses, which we can separate. One is agriculture, one is development, which can be anything. It can be a casino, it can be structures associated with agriculture. Uh, it could be tourism, it could be anything. The satellite imagery doesn't, doesn't tell us what it is. Um, when we combine these into a single index, which is sort of like the cleanest exercise we can do, we get that, um, holding the land in fee simple in a close neighborhood to a comparison allotment that is held in trust gives you about 20 percent, uh, 20.2 uh, standard deviations, better land usage or more land usage in the aggregate. Um, in the IV, that effect gets a little bit bigger. That's not very meaningful to you right now because I haven't told you anything about the IV yet. Uh, and then when we break this down separately into agriculture, and um, development, we find effects on both margins. And I'll tell you a little bit about that separately. Um, we perform a sort of back of the envelope exercise uh, that comes with a few caveats that I'm gonna tell you about uh, to, to uh, translate this into land values. And so when we translate this into land values and scale it up to the 160 acre allotment, we get that the difference in value is roughly between $200,000 and $700,000 um, per allotment. So scaling the numbers that you have in front of you here uh, up by 160, essentially. For identification, we sort of worry about two different things. One is we worry about selection on land. 
So it's very plausible to think that perhaps better land, most likely better land, was more likely to be transferred into fee simple. And therefore, a fee simple versus a lot of trust land comparison will be partly confounded by land quality. Uh, the very fine grained nature of the satellite imagery we have to work with allows us to do a lot on that front in terms of addressing that. Um, but there is a second concern, which is selection on people, which even if you have a very close spatial comparison between, let's say, two neighboring plots of land, where you can say these are truly of, of very comparable or identical land characteristics, uh, it might well still be the case that the original LOTs randomly differed in their characteristics and that original LOTs who were perhaps took to farming in a way that their neighboring LOT did not were more likely to obtain their land in fee simple and that that part that is partly confounding our comparison and so to address that we have a separate IV strategy that I'm going to tell you about when, when we get there not, not much point previewing that in too much detail um, and then on the mechanism front we're going to be looking at this comparison is always going to entail two economic mechanisms for us one is the collateralizability access to credit story the second is the fractionation of claimants and the resulting transaction costs and so we're going to try to parse those apart or at least provide evidence that uh, to what extent both both are at play so i'll i'll spend a couple of minutes talking about space so um Almost all reservations in the US today are, are west of the Mississippi, which means they're all surveyed under the PLS, uh, PLSS grid, which makes them relatively easy to work with. So basically, uh, space practically everywhere that we have data is divided into townships. So the township is this white grid in the middle of this uh, graph. Uh, a township is a 36 square mile slicing of space. And then it comes in 36 section. Each section is one square mile. Uh, and so if you look at the yellow cutout uh, in the bottom left of this slide, this is section 14 of one township. And then within this section 14, you have four quarter sections. So each quarter section is a quarter of a square mile, which is 160 acres, which is the size of a homestead and the size of an Indian allotment. So essentially the bottom left of this is four allotments, which themselves are subdivided into quarters, but you can ignore that bit. So those are so-called alley courts, we don't need those. So everything here is in quarter sections. And let me give you a little bit more of a sense for the, the fineness or, or the slicing of the data. So this is our satellite imagery. What you're looking at here is four sections. So four square miles, uh, which means four by four allotments, four by four, 160 acre allotments. So each of these squares you're looking at is an observation in our data. And uh, land can be either agriculturally developed, which is this uh, green shading, or it can be uh, developed as uh, structures, which is the red shading. And then we're dividing out any water uh, from the denominator. So water plays no role. There's no like noise being introduced by bodies of water being, being in our data. And so one square, one out of the 16 squares you're looking at here is one data point for us. And then in the baseline, we're creating an index of the red and the green to give us a usage index, but you can easily also parse those apart. This picture gives you a sense for within a reservation. So most applied work on Native Americans that is focused on reservations would be using reservations as the unit of observation. What you're looking at here is Pine Ridge, uh, a medium to large sized reservation. And so the larger squares on Pine Ridge here are townships. Each township has 36 sections, which means it has 36 times four, which is 164 allotments or quarter sections. Not all of these are allotments. And so what you're looking at here is um, Pine Ridge has perhaps, let's say, in the ballpark of 100 townships. Each of these townships has 164 quarter sections. And if you're looking at an orange quarter section, then that is an allotment that is still held in trust today. If you're looking at a gray quarter section, then that is an original allotment that is held under fee simple, so full property rights. And then the residual white space, for the most part, 
is tribal land. So this is land that is just owned by Pine Ridge Reservation, uh, communally owned, if you like. If you zoom out further, this is a picture of the majority of reservations in the US today, all of them west of the Mississippi. Uh, and so what jumps out at you here is you can see most reservations, but what you're actually looking at is not reservation boundaries, but what you're actually looking at is these beehives, if you like, of allotments. And that includes, for instance, allotments in California, in Northern California, where you actually don't have reservations because those got dissolved. Um, but you have these clusters of um, Native American owned land. Uh, this picture is just to say we have pretty fine grained um, data, which allows us to use very fine grained spatial fixed effects for our statistical uh, estimation. So if we're worried about getting an apples to apples comparison by comparing a fee simple versus trust land, um, two, two allotments, one under fee simple, one under trust, uh, a lot of what might make those not apples to apples are going to be spatial characteristics that will get wiped out by finer and finer spatial fixed effects. And that's just what this picture here shows you. In the empirics, what we do is we sort of walk our way from a uh, reservation fixed effect to a township fixed effect, which would have 36 square miles, to what you see on the left of this uh, slide here would be a quarter of a township fixed effect. So that would be nine square miles, so four times nine square miles, or one ninth of a, a township fixed effect, which would be nine four square fixed effects, uh, so that you only compare comparing within four square miles. And then the finest is on the right, where you would only be comparing um, allotments, so the, the smallest possible square, within one of these um, thick line squares, which would be a square mile, okay? So that's all very abstract. Um, and a picture Can often says more than a slides? thousand words. And just, I don't know if you said it, I couldn't catch it. What's going on in Oklahoma? Like, is there just none of this going on in Oklahoma? Oklahoma is not on the map. The reason Oklahoma is not on the map is Oklahoma has the highest density of um, Native Americans in the US because the five civilized tribes were removed there from the southeastern United States, but they are not reservations. They're Oklahoma tribal statistical areas. So the federal government uh, took away their reservation status in 1907. So Oklahoma doesn't have reservations. Uh, all of the civilized tribes in Oklahoma were allotted and every single one of those allotment was by uh, an act of Congress transferred into fee simple. And so because Oklahoma is so different, uh, in those two dimensions. Oklahoma doesn't actually have reservations. And uh, by the way, when I'm looking this way, I'm looking at you, Ellison. Uh, Oklahoma doesn't actually have reservations. And uh, secondly, every allotment was transferred into fee simple. So you're not getting any within comparison. You're not getting any apples to apples comparison within uh, Oklahoma. And that's why we're dropping Oklahoma from the analysis. Okay, thank you. So, so Within the scope of fine spatial fixed effects, which we're using here, even if we included Oklahoma in the data set, it would not provide any identifying variation for you. Yeah. So the Oklahoma comparison is just a tough one to make. It's just, in a, in a sense, it's its own story. Um, this is a picture just because a picture says more than a thousand words. So if you have very fine spatial fixed effects, what you end up comparing is just adjacent land plots. And so this is actually a photograph from Dustin's reservation, the Northern Cheyenne in southeastern Montana, where uh, you can see a fence running through the middle of this picture, which separates one allotment on the left hand side, which is held in fee simple, to a neighboring allotment, uh, identical land characteristics, obviously, but what you can see is that the land on the right hand side, which is held in trust, is not worked, not farmed, and when you zoom into these pictures, you see that all the structures are very decrepit, very, uh, whereas all the structures on the right hand, on the left hand side are very well maintained. Essentially, you're looking at a well functioning uh, ranch versus a decrepit piece of unused land of the same land characteristics. Um, okay. From an identification point of view, uh, we sort of try to separate uh, selection on land which is what I've just spent the last five minutes talking about, 
from selection on individuals. The selection on land, we're gonna largely try to address through spatial control. So I'm gonna show you that. Uh, and then we're gonna acknowledge or, or, or um, claim that selection on land or whatever land, whatever controls for land you have, it's not gonna address any concerns you might have. So if you go back to this picture, Maybe the original LOT who happened to randomly be given the left the land on the left hand side of the fence, maybe that person or that family, maybe they just took to ranching or they took to farming better than the original LOT on the right hand side. And maybe that is a family trait or maybe that's a cultural trait that was passed on or whatever story you might want to think about, there's at least scope for selection on individual characteristics of the LOTs. And so we try to address that as well with an IV strategy that I'm going to tell you about in a second. So this is uh, on the um, spatial um, identification strategy. So this is simply an ordinarily squares regression of an, a land use index that combines um, agriculture and development into a single index expressed in standard deviations and regresses it simply on this dummy for fee simple and then going from columns one to six, left to right, you're just introducing better controls for observable land characteristics, as well as uh, introducing from columns three, three to six, finer and finer spatial fixed effects. So by the time you get to column six, you have, you're really only comparing immediately adjacent plots within a square mile. Our preferred specification is column five. The main reason being that any, um, any differences on observable land characteristics disappear by the time you get to nine fixed effects per township. And then the upside of doing nine versus 36 is you can see in the number of observations that drops quite a bit in column six. The reason is singletons. So when you go all the way back um, to the Pine Ridge map, if you start zooming in too close, you start getting a whole bunch of um, one square mile fixed effects with only a single observation in them. And so there is no comparison within that anymore. So you're dropping observations in that way. And for that reason, column five is sort of like our preferred specification. And what that specification would suggest is that having your land in fee simple gives you about a, a 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.2 standard deviations, higher land usage to make that more meaningful you know, we, we can break it, we can break the results into agriculture versus uh, development separately or map it into, into a value, a dollar value term for land, uh, for land values. Um, to, to address selection on people, we built two instruments. One is the age of the original LOT. And so what we do is we show that, so we have all the allotment data and in the allotment data, we can see the ages of the original LOTs. And what you're looking at right now is a normalized graph that um, gives you for each reservation the year in which most allotments were issued. And so it turns out that the way they did this is they allotted basically everyone who was um, alive and not a small child. So ev basically everyone who was alive and not a small child received an allotment which is uh, on the Y on the vertical, you have the zero year being the year in which uh, the brunt of allotments on a reservation were issued. And then you see towards the right on the horizontal that it didn't matter whether you were 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, or 70 years old, at, the, at this initial year zero, under any of those slicings, you received your allotment in year zero. And then as you go towards the left, what you get is people that were not born yet and were later phased in with additional allotments. Okay. And so this turns out to be quite predictive of whether you obtained your land in fee simple, because when they shut down the process in 1934, younger people who had more recently obtained their allotments had a much higher probability of not having had their land be transferred into fee simple yet. And so this instrument, hinges on uh, the exclusion restriction that the age of the LOT of the original LOT a hundred years ago has no effect on the proficiency for farming or any economic choices made by their descendants today, other than through the fact that they were more less likely to obtain uh, the land in fee simple. 
Andy, how am I doing for time? You have about a minute. A minute? No, no, but you can take a few more. Uh, okay, so I'll you have you some time to wrap up because uh, the um, question queue at the moment isn't exactly bursting. So okay. take, a, okay, take I'll a few hurry more up. minutes and then uh, we can start with the Q&A. Okay, so I'll hurry up. So we have a second instrument which is a little bit more clever, if you like, or a little bit more involved or a little bit less direct. Uh, what this is, is we built a panel of all the agents that um, were responsible for allotment on reservations from 1887 until 1934. These agents turn out in the data to vary dramatically in their propensity. So they had the discretionary room to decide on whether to transfer the land or not. They vary dramatically in their propensity to do that and they were exogenously rotated around every four years, essentially with presidential administrations. And so the logic of the second instrument is that if you had a high propensity to transfer agent on your reservation at a time when you were very young and not yet eligible to receive the land in, in Fee Simple or had only recently obtained your land, then having this high propensity agent didn't really buy you anything. But if you had a high propensity to transfer agent later in a game at a time when you were eligible for transfer, it really mattered because the two things interacted with each other. And so based on that, we construct out of a probability tree, a constructed probability of transfer that is an interaction of the time at which an allotment was issued to an individual interacted with the subsequent rotation of agents on a reservation and their separately estimated propensities to transfer land into fee simple. Based on all that, we're constructing an instrument Z that is the constructed probability of having had your land transferred into fee simple by 1934. And so the bottom panel of this IV table here shows you that um, the, later, the, the later your allotment year, the less likely you were to obtain your land in fee simple. That's the first picture I showed you with this kink in allotment age. Um, and the higher the constructed probability of seeing, of having your land transferred, the higher in fact was the probability of having your land transferred into fee simple. And then the resulting IV estimates are in the top panel here. And if you focus back on column five, you see that now we're at about uh, 0.45 standard deviations. So roughly double what the OLS suggests, okay? And then, you know, in the interest of time, I'm gonna leave it there and just jump into quickly what else we do in this panel. So, so this is sort of the identification bit out of the way. Uh, the other things we do in the paper is um, we break this index into its development versus agriculture components. And we find something actually very interesting there, which is that there's pronounced effects on both, uh, but we have satellite imagery from 1970 until today in I believe 10 year waves. And what you see is that the agriculture effect was already very present in 1970, but there was zero effect on development. And we give a little bit of background information on economic development and structural transformation on reservations to rationalize that. The long and short of it is that the agriculture effect was already there 40 years ago and hasn't changed all that much, but the effect on development has really evolved in, in more recent decades. And that's just a feature of the fact that development is a more recent phenomenon on reservations. So 30, 40 years ago, you just didn't have all that much uh, developed land on reservations full stop. Then we bring in tribal land for which we have um, less of a clear identification strategy, but it's very, very important. And so in a nutshell, with you know, a few more caveats, statistical caveats attached to that comparison, we find that tribal land is used of, uh, is used with an efficiency that's sort of intermediate in between trust land and fee simple land. So tribal land is more efficiently used than trust land, but less efficiently used than fee simple. And so that creates certain trade-offs from our perspective. From a pure efficiency point of view, fee simple land is the best, but tribal land does ensure a certain degree of sovereignty and a certain uh, degree of coherence of the land base under, under tribal control. That, uh, and so there's a trade-off there and, and we take that trade-off seriously and we discuss it in the paper. And I'm gonna take, come to that in my conclusion. Um, I've already mentioned the stuff on the land value. So let me actually jump to the conclusion because I do wanna spend a second talking about what, what do we learn from all this? So from one perspective, I think this is a little bit of a um, cautionary tale, if you like, 
of programs of social transformation. So when you, when you think back to the 1880s and you look at, you know, why did we do all this? Why did we do Indian allotment? It was very much out of a paternalistic but well-meaning motive to, to help Native Americans. So you had these Indian Rights Association, you had the National Indian Defense Association, you had lots of these kinds of like friends of the Indians associations, all of whom were sort of actively thinking about how can we help Native Americans uh, and, and the conclusion at the time was very much that cultural assimilation was necessary for their survival and their prosperity, and that private property was a necessary re requirement for that. Uh, but then 50 years later, you have essentially a new generation of social planners with different visions and different um, beliefs and also new information. So, so that shouldn't be, that goes back to Allison's comment about uh, you know, there, there certainly were some problems in, in the process of, of, of um, land privatization. And so, you know, whether or not it was a good idea to begin with is sort of orthogonal to this argument. The point is they stopped it. And I think stopping it in and of itself isn't necessarily a problem, but they kind of left it there. So everything that had happened up to 1934 was just sort of left in limbo, land that had been transferred into fee simple, remained fee simple forever. And I think legally that actually couldn't have been done any other way. Uh, land that was under tribal control remained under tribal control. And I believe that's perfectly fine. Uh, the problem is that you also left this land that was kind of on the transition path, if you like. Land was never meant to stay in this in-trust in-between stage, but they kind of just left it there. And they've left it there for the last 80 years. And really that's, I think, I think this, the philosophical, if you like, problem is that you have one generation of social planners just sort of overruling what the previous one did, but then not finding a good way of, of, of providing closure to this, to this social transformation program, if you like. And so I think this is a real problem on reservations today. And so how do you solve that? Um, what we say in the paper is that in trust land clearly is just not being in a lot of trust is clearly just not a good state of the world from land, a land efficiency point of view, but also from a long land sovereignty point of view. And so you can do two things. You can either complete the program if you like, if you like to call it that by taking the interest land and converting it into fee simple that should be good, according to what we find in the data, should be very good for land use efficiency. Um, but we recognize that tribes might be concerned that if they transfer everything into fee simple, they might also erode their control and, and the coherence of their tribal reservation land mass. And so the alternative, so we don't, we, we don't pertain to or prefer to make that decision for the tribes, obviously, uh, that we, we strongly believe that that needs to be a decentralized decision that is made by the tribes. But, the, but there is an alternative path, which is to take the allotted interest land and return it back to tribal control. From a legal perspective, there are templates and pathways for both. So there's something called the Cobell lawsuit, uh, which had recently been settled a couple of years ago between tribes and the Bureau of Indian Affairs which actually gives funding to tribes to repurchase individually held in-trust land and bring it back under the umbrella of tribal control. So we think that that is certainly an improvement on what you have at the moment. And so giving more funding to tribes to do that, we believe is, a, is definitely one of two improvements that are possible. The alternative is that you just see this process that was never completed 80 years ago to completion by transferring the interest land into fee simple. Legally, that's very complicated because on some of these allotments, you have 400 claimants. And so you sort of need to cut through this mess of claims. But there's something called the Uniform Law Commission that actually works on providing templates like that. And they have a template for that, for dissolving a very similar problem in the US South, uh, where you have a lot of heirs property. Heirs property is, is property that actually suffers from a lot of, a lot of the same problems that uh, reservation trust land suffers from. And so there is a legal template for that. And so the conclusion of our paper is either one of these paths is preferable to the status quo, which, paths, which path 
a reservation or, or a tribe wants to take clearly should be that tribe's choice. And then uh, lastly, we think that it also doesn't need to be a binary decision. And we do this comparison to how Mexico handled um, a similar kind of situation in their second land reform in the early 2000s, where they took indigenous land with usufruct rights, gave them full property rights and let the indigenous communities, the ejidos, decide on what they then wanted to do uh, with, with the full property rights, whether they wanted to keep them communal only or allow members of the community to transfer or alienate the land to non-communal members. So there is a template for doing such a thing. Uh, clearly this should be a choice made by tribe, but our point is merely that there is a template, there is a historical precedent for doing this sort of, finding this sort of intermediate solution um, to the problem. And with that, I cede the floor. All right, thank you very much, Christian. Um, very interesting talk and um, one of um, uh, the minority uh, pieces in economic history that does have a policy implication. So our first um, question uh, comes from Jeremy Weber, who had a, um, a remark or a question rather on your reservation land picture. Jeremy, if you want, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Otherwise, I'll just read it out. Sure. The picture was striking because I, went, I wasn't sure exactly which side was going to be the fee simple. Um, in kind of environmental economics, there's the question of how security of property rights affects kind of the environmental stewardship of the land. And uh, clearly the fee simple land is being used a lot more intensely or intensively, whereas the uh, trust land looks like it could have been a conservation reserve parcel um, where a biologist or ecologist could look at that and say, this is great. We want more of this. The soil is stable. It's not being overgrazed. Maybe, maybe someone would say that the other side is being overgrazed, uses it intensely. So I know this isn't the focus of your research, but um, do you think that there's, or have you looked into kind of specifics of how property rights of this nature um, affect kind of long-term um, productivity of the soil or kind of uh, any environmental outcomes? Um, I mean, that's certainly important. Um, there is work by Eric Elson, let me see here, the Guy, the Guy et al. paper. Um, can you see this, the, the, the lit review here? Uh, so, so the Guy et al. paper, the second from the bottom, is one on land tenure and irrigation. And so broadly speaking, privately owned land, so fee simple land will be used more um, extensively. And there is certainly a potential downside of ex exhausting the soil. But I think that goes a little bit back to this philosophical question. Is it our job to tell a Native American claimant on the land not to overuse the soil. And, and, and you know, I think different people will have different answers to that. Um, I would say no, I think, I, I would say that they, they need to um, make those determinations for themselves. Um, I, I, I suppose the Guy al paper shows that they will also irrigate more intensively. So maybe that's a, that's a counterbalance. Um, a lot of the land is also pure ranching land. And so I'm less certain to what extent you can exhaust the soil. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm simply neither an environmental nor an agricultural economist to know the answer to that. Uh, but I wonder if you can exhaust the soil in that sense with ranching. I know, I know that irrigation is very important when it comes to ranching, whether soil erosion and things like that are an important factor, I'm, I'm less certain about. Um, it, it is a concern. And then I think you just need to make a, yeah, I, I'm gonna call it philosophical for lack of a better term, determination of who should have the decision-making power to, to, to address that concern. Uh, the, the last bullet here on the Leonard and Parker um, paper would, would be a case in point for you because there's also going to be more fracking on land with fee sim on fee simple land than on interest land. And I can see a world where not everyone agrees that more fracking is better, even if the, the owners of the land might, might think that more fracking is better. Okay, 
Very good. So our first question was also our last question because nobody else has entered the queue. So I guess for the last couple of minutes, it's um, free for all. So if you have a question, um, feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask away. <laughs> maybe I can maybe I can tell you one more interesting story, and maybe that that gets gets another question or two going. So one thing that I'm working on with Adam Krippel, who was here earlier, I can't see if he's still there now, and might actually also work with, with Ilya um, uh, from what Adam just told me, is one aspect that this has created, which is not environmental at all, but might be interesting uh, for, for, for you guys, because um, uh, Jennifer mentioned that you also have a criminal justice arm or policing arm. We're working on a project here. This This also creates, this kind of patchwork creates this incredible problem of jurisdictional gaps where you have um, tribal police be in charge of crimes committed by Indians on reservations, but the sheriff's department being in charge of crimes committed by non-Indians on reservations, and the FBI and the attorney general's office being in charge of severe crimes being committed by anyone on reservations. <clears throat> and so this patchwork of different land tenures what this creates is it creates areas inside reservations that are occupied by non-tribal members. They are inside the polity that we call the reservation, but the reservation actually doesn't have uh, jurisdictional or executive control over those areas. And so one really bad consequence of this sort of uh, of this sort of like historical legacy of patchworky land tenures is that you have these huge jurisdictional gaps where no one knows who is in charge of policing crime and because no one knows who's in charge or or the cost of deciding are prohibitively high, basically crime doesn't get policed. And so you have, you have this huge problem of under policing on reservations. That is not just a resource problem, but just it's a transaction cost problem. So, oh. no, I was going to ask if you had um, considered applying your ideas to other kinds of resources besides land. Um, I mean, so, I mean, one thing that I get interested in, in is radio spectrum, for instance, and that's, I know there's a whole proceeding on at the FCC on that, but you could imagine irrigation, you could imagine other kinds of resources that might be uh, equally, that might fall under a similar kind of an analytical frame. I think that's right. So I think what we're, going to do is we're going to, you know, once once everything is said and done and we have all the replication data, you know, on, on our websites or on a journal or somewhere, um, this georeference data is going to be available to anyone. And so then the, the, the primary contribution we will have made is we will have combined the satellite imagery um, geolocated at the quarter section level with the legal title of the land. And so then you can combine this with any other geographic data that you can break down at the section level, quarter section level, or what have you, and and study things like that. Uh, another thing you can do is you can you can apply this to a more networked spatial analysis, which we're not doing. So we're very much comparing a neighboring apple to a neighboring apple, but um, for certain kinds of economic activity. And I don't know if if radio spectrum, maybe the position of towers would would apply to that, but um, there might be some pretty strong network effects here of neighboring parcels, um, you know, spilling over onto the usage of, of, of network activities. Um, so we haven't done that yet, but the, the data project would, or the data product would be out there for, for any kind of idea like that. Okay, so this is uh, pretty much the end of um, the official time for the seminar. So let's give um, Christian uh, we have usually very sad uh, online round of applause, but I uh, think that we're applauding you and your efforts. Um, we have the room for another half hour, so if you want to stick around,